We've been going through the book of Acts, so for those of you that have been a part of things here, you know that for the last nine weeks, we're in our 10th week, we've been going through the book of Acts, calling this series to the ends of the earth, and this series is meant to take us through the whole calendar year. So we've committed each Sunday to this book, the book of Acts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and then Acts in the New Testament, and Acts is the story of how the early church began. Right, So Jesus came and he lived life and he had ministry and then he died. He gave his life willingly, obediently to the cross. He took on the sins of all mankind and the world and then he rose from the dead having defeated death. He revealed himself to the followers of Jesus and then he ascended into heaven and the Holy Spirit then came down and dwelled within the lives of the believers, the followers of Jesus, and then were empowered to be God's witness to the world. And so we've gone through the process of looking at different sections of Acts in sequential order, and we've now gotten to Acts chapter 5, verse 1. That's where we currently, we've currently landed. Now, I want to set the stage. Before we go into the passage here today, I want to just let you know this passage is one of the most difficult, confounding um, uh, controversial maybe passages in Acts, if not in all of Scripture. And I would be lying to you if I, if I um, didn't say that um, I was tempted to skip over it. <laughs> but I didn't give in to that temptation because it's important. It's there for a reason. And because it's there, we have to mine through. We have to figure out what is it that God is speaking to us through this passage. So we're going to do that. But we're going to do it a little bit differently um, in that we're going to do it systematically. We're going to kind of parse through this particular verses within this passage and look at what is it that the author, Luke, is saying here. What ultimately can we learn and glean from it? So we're going to read the passage together. And then we're going to pray. We're going to pray for God's wisdom and discernment as we venture into it. And then we're going to jump in. All right. So if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to Acts chapter 5, Acts chapter 5. Um, if you don't have your Bibles, no worries, there's some in front of you, it's also going to be on the screen, um, you have your Bible app as well. <clears throat> so starting with verse 1, Acts chapter 5, this is what it says. Now, a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. Then Peter, Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land? Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied just to human beings, but to God. And when Ananias heard this, he fell down and died. And great fear seized all who heard what had happened. Then some young men came forward, wrapped up his body, and carried him out and buried him. About three hours later, his wife came, three hours later, sorry, couldn't help it. Three hours later, his wife came in not knowing what had happened. Peter asked her, tell me, is this the price you and Ananias got for the land? Yes, she said, that is the price. Peter said to her, how could you conspire to test the spirit of the Lord? Listen. The feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out also. At that moment, she fell down at his feet and died. Then the young men came in, and finding her dead, carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. What in the world? 
I mean, you, you read a passage like that, and I think that that's an appropriate question. What in the world is going on here? First thing, you know, that came to my mind before we pray for God's sermon through this passage, I, I just wanted to uh, um, uh, help you kind of uh, get an understanding of what went through my mind as I was preparing. Now, I've read this passage. I've heard this passage before. Maybe this is a passage you've never heard about before. You've never read this is a new thing for you. Maybe this is one that you've, that you've heard, but you've never heard preached about or really even talked about. But one of the things that came to my mind when I was doing study leading up to this Sunday was um, how, how careless have we grown accustomed, how carelessly have we grown accustomed to um, not understanding the severity of our sin? that we would even ask the question, why such an extreme response? Why such an extreme consequence to sin? How commonplace is sin in our lives that we would have a response where we would be like, huh, sin has some really bad consequences? Now with that being said, This passage does require some explanation and some uh, uh, courage, and we're we're going to invest in both those things here uh, today. But before we do that, we're going to pray. And I invite you to not only listen um, to what I'm praying, but to uh, uh, agree with it yourselves um, so that we can go into this together uh, with tremendous discernment. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, You number our hairs and you determine our days. You hang the stars and you feed the sparrows. Father, you open doors that no one can shut and you shut doors that no one can open. Indeed, we we can trust you. So Father, I, I pray that you would help us by giving us great wisdom, discernment, and then peaceful hearts. I pray, Lord, that you would guide us as we discover your word, not looking for what we want, but rather what you desire, what you desire for your church and what you desire for our lives. I pray that in all things and always you would make us more and more like your son, Jesus all for your glory. Amen. All right. You guys ready? You buckled up? Let's give it a whirl. Acts chapter 5, verse 1 and 2. Now a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, also sold a piece of property, and with his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. All right. Verses 1 through 11. The most important word in this whole passage is on the screen right now. Who would like to guess? Who would like to guess what, what word is that? What word is the most important word in all of the passage that's on the screen right now? Now, it's okay, you might get it wrong, but it's what makes it fun. Who would like to guess? What most important word? What was that? Knowledge. Knowledge? Great word, but not the right word. What was that? Kept? We'll get to that in a little bit. Not, Not the word, though. Oh, man. Nope, but that's okay. That's okay. It's elusive. The most important word in this passage is the word now. <laughs> Probably wondering why, right? That's a conjunction. In some of your interpretations, it's the word but. You see, this passage, this story of Ananias and Sapphira, this is a comparative passage. It cannot be uh, taken at face value just in and of itself. It is connected to what? What preceded it? 
What precedes this? We looked at this last week. At the end of chapter 4, we see how the early church is now committing to this grand relationship with each other, all for the purpose of glorifying God. And specifically, we're going to look here at the end of chapter 4, verses 34. Let's go to that. There were no needy persons among them. For time, from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them brought the money from the sales, and then put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone who had need. Now, this is the key part right here in, verse, in the next verse. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, whom we'll get to later in Acts, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. This is the passage then that verses 1 through 11 of chapter 5 is comparing itself to. Basically, we could put it like this. This is the right way of doing it. This is the wrong way of doing it. Specifically, though, today what we're going to look at is what makes what happens in verses 1 through 11 of chapter 5 not right. What did Barnabas do? What did Barnabas do? He sold his land. Remember it says in those, in those verses at the end of chapter 4 that some people within the fellowship of believers, within the community of believers, decided to sell their property or their land and then give the proceeds to the church. Some people, it doesn't say that they were commanded to. It doesn't say that all were forced to. We talked about that last week, right? This wasn't um, a, a commune. Rather, this was the process, the commitment to holding all things with an open hand so that God, as he willed it, not as we willed it, but as God willed it, could then take whatever and then give and use for people who were in need. So Barnabas sold the land, and then he took the entire proceeds and he laid it at the apostles' feet. Unlike Barnabas, though, Ananias, and these are just facts, this is what we read in the verses, Ananias and Sapphira also sold their property, but what did they do differently? They, they kept back a portion of that, and then they gave the rest to the church. But notice what they, what they did. It wasn't that they kept back a portion, but it was that they gave the remainder as if it was everything. They gave the remainder and pretended that that which they were giving to the church was all that they had received from the sale. We'll we'll dive into that a little bit more, but I want to make that distinction clear. Now, first, uh, just wanna, before we go any further, a quick side note. So um, it wasn't that putting uh, the, those proceeds, whether it's Barnabas, Ananias, and Sapphira, or anybody else, putting it at the apostles' feet was not an act of um, uh, honoring royalty. It wasn't that the apostles were sitting on thrones and demanding that money be given to them. Um, that's not what's going on here. Instead, this is being treated as somewhat of a trust, where the money is being given to the leaders of the church who are then responsible for its dispersion, namely to those who are in need. So here we have <clears throat> this, this moment where Ananias and Sapphira, they have uh, sold their land and their property, and then they give some money to the church. But if we go back to the previous um, passage in uh, chapter 5, verses 1-2, there it is. Now, a man named Ananias, he, with his wife, full knowledge, kept back part of the money for himself. The key phrase here is kept back. Now, at first glance, I get it. At first glance, that could seem like a rather harmless thing. I mean, we do that, don't we? We get a wage 
And we decide then how to disperse that, those monies. You know, we got savings accounts, and we obviously have our checking. We got bills to pay. And then I'm hoping, I'm hoping that, that you're also committing to tithe. Uh, tithe isn't just a um, portion, whatever you determine. It's 10%. Uh, that we're giving 10% of what it is that we receive because it's not ours, it's God's. And we're giving it to the church. Um, but we're not only doing that, but we're actually generously giving even beyond that. I hope that that's true. But that's very similar, right? We're keeping money back. You're not, you're not giving all of your wage to the church. It isn't that they just kept a portion for themselves. What does kept back mean? Well, let's look at the original language. New Testament was written in what language? Greek, ancient Greek, Koine Greek. And so it's helpful to look at these words and to understand what their actual meanings are. So that word kept back is the Greek word nosphizomai. How many times do you think I practiced that in order to be able to say it right here today? Nosphizomai. Now this word nosphizomai, what it doesn't mean is that Ananias and Sapphira were keeping a portion for themselves, just like you and I would do if you know, once we receive a wage, we, we keep a certain portion to use for this, and then we give another portion to the church. That's not what what uh, this word means. Instead, this word nos phizomai, this word kept back, means to embezzle. It means to steal. It means to misappropriate. The issue is not that Ananias and Sapphira were condemned or um, guilty of keeping back money for themselves. We're going to get to that in a little bit. That wasn't the issue. The issue was that they were seeking to deceive others, namely the Holy Spirit, in pretending like they were giving everything when in fact they weren't. Let's go a little bit further. In verses 3 through 4, Peter says to Ananias, he says, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you received from the land. Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, was it the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied just to human beings, but to God. Now there's so much just in that statement that Peter makes to Ananias. See, Peter knew that Ananias was, was lying, and he was calling him out on that. But one thing I want, to, I want to point out as we look at this passage here, it wasn't, again, it wasn't that Ananias and Sapphira were commanded or that they were being condemned or made to feel guilty because they weren't giving everything to the church. Because even Peter himself, what does he say? He says, um, uh, why is it that you kept some for yourself, uh, the money you received for the land? Uh, you lied to the Holy Spirit. You lie, you're lying to us. Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? So he's saying you were given something. It was yours. It was your responsibility to be a steward of that. And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What's Peter saying there? What's Peter saying there? Anybody want to? Use as you want. Wasn't that your right, Ananias? Yet what you decided to do was to pretend, was to deceive us and especially the Holy Spirit into thinking you're making a sacrifice when in reality you aren't. It's the deception that is key here. Another thing that Peter does in this passage that I think is important to point out is he connects the deception then, underlying, underlining the deception of Ananias to that of Satan himself. 
Now, sin entered into the world when Adam and Eve sinned um, and entered into us. We are now born with a sin nature and entered into the world. We are now uh, encumbered by sin, thus creating that division between us and God, which then Jesus built a bridge in order to give us the ability to be able to have a right relationship with God. It is only because of him. But it's interesting, deception existed before sin. 2 Corinthians 11.3, Paul testifies to this, but I am afraid that just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning, your minds may somehow be led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. And Satan continues today, doesn't he? He continues to deceive and then lead us into acts of deception. Remember, 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 we wrestle not against flesh and blood, do we? We wrestle against principalities, against rulers of this dark world. Let's move on. Verse 5. When Ananias heard this, he fell down and died. And great fear seized all who heard what happened. Now, I'm going to um, uh, just put this out there. I'll scratch the itch, but I'm not going to take it away. Because it doesn't say why or how Ananias died. Did God strike him dead? Uh, Did Peter um, curse him somehow and he died as a result? Or was the shock of knowing that he has been found out to have deceived the church and also the Holy Spirit, mind you, this is only months removed from the Holy Spirit coming down from the heavens and tongues of fire and indwelling the lives of the followers of Jesus? I mean, this is like big Big deal stuff. Could it have been that the shock of that was so tremendous that maybe his heart gave out? Who knows? The reality is we don't know. Um, you, can, you can ask God when you enter into his presence, although I think you'll have other things on your, <laughs> your mind at that point. But what we do know is that this was a massive shock to all those that were present and then those who heard about this afterwards. So Ananias sought to deceive the Holy Spirit. He was found out. He subsequently died. And Acts 5 then tells us that Ananias' lifeless body was taken out and immediately buried. And then three hours later, his wife Sapphira then comes into uh, the picture. And we see what happens in verse 8. Peter asks her, Sapphira, tell me, is this the price you and Ananias got for the land? Yes, she said, that is the price. So Peter doesn't mince words. He goes right for the jugular. And what is it that he's giving Sapphira an opportunity to to do in this moment? To confess, to come clean, yes. But she doesn't do that. Instead, she doubles down. She digs her heels in even more. And she resets the price. So then we go forward into verses 9 through 11. Peter then said to her, based on that response, how could you conspire to test the spirit of the Lord? Listen, the feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out also. And at that moment, she fell at his feet and died. Then the young men came in, and finding her dead, carried her out and buried her beside her husband. Great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about those events. Now, the temptation in this passage and in its interpretation is to focus on the death of Ananias and Sapphira. That becomes an obstacle. That becomes a hurdle. But it's an unnecessary one because that's not the point of the passage. What is the real issue that this story, Ananias and Sapphira, is addressing? It's not what they did but to whom they did it to. It's not what they did, it's to whom they did it to. The nature of sin. See, when it comes to our sin, the temptation is to think that our sin only affects the people around us. But what's the problem with that? If our sin 
doesn't noticeably to us affect people around us, we don't tend to give that sin a lot of weight. But if that sin uh, materializes in how it affects, you know, uh, it, it, with some negative consequences, those around us, and then we tend to wake up to that sin. But first and foremost, our sin is an affront to whom? God. That's why, that's why Peter, what does he say when, when Ananias comes? What is, the, what is that Peter underlines? What is it that, that Ananias is doing? In verse 4, he says, You have not lied just to human beings, but to God. Make no mistake, sin is always, first and foremost, an affront to God. To God. Our sin, yes, it affects those around us, and sometimes quite painfully, but sin is always an affront to God first. And then it is ultimately to God that we must be held accountable. Tim Keller, he points out to the true nature of Ananias and Sapphira's sin. Tim Keller, Pastor Tim Keller, he says this, Ananias and Sapphira are guilty of using God instead of serving him. Guilty of using God instead of serving him. So where does this, where does this bring us here? God is not a vending machine. He's not a vending machine that we're to drop a few coins in in hopes of getting what it is that we want. And he's also not a system that we can work around or circumvent in vain to get things. That's why we talked last week about, about an open hand. Because the only thing that we owe God, because of Jesus Christ, because Jesus paid our debt, he paid it all. The only thing that we owe God is our devotion. And how do we give God our devotion? We give God our devotion by presenting to him an open hand. When we present to God an open hand, we're saying, God, all these things, all these resources, all these talents, all this money, all, these, all this time, it is yours. It's yours. And I want you to use these things the way that you see fit. When we hold those things with an open hand, we're saying, God, I'm solely devoted to your agenda, not my own. And yes, sometimes, God, your agenda will intersect with mine and and we'll be in step. But sometimes, God's agenda is not ours. And when we hold things with with a clenched fist, we are not giving God the devotion that he deserves. That's That's what this story is teaching us. These things that we convince ourselves that are ours are not. We are stewards. We are given the responsibility. Are you holding these things with an open hand? And in doing so, are you devoting yourself to God and to God alone? As we've done every week through this series, we're going to say this creed together and invite you to please raise your voices and say this with me. We are the church. We have received power from the Holy Spirit. We are Jesus' witness to the world. We will give the love of Jesus to each other, to our community, and to the ends of the earth because we are the church. Amen. Thank you so much for being with us here today. The team will continue to finish this song in celebration of the relationship that we have with God because of Jesus. You can continue to worship or you're free to leave.
We hope that you enjoy the warm weather. Praise God. And we'll see you next Sunday.